We've been investigating the paranormal and uploading videos to YouTube for about 13 years. And for the last 11 years on this channel, we have started every investigation with what we call an abandonment session. And that is when we set up cameras and equipment throughout these haunted buildings and leave to see what is captured when these buildings are completely empty. Throughout the years of doing this, we've captured some of the most amazing paranormal activity. But a lot of people have asked us, where did abandonment begin? How did it start? In the summer of 2012, we investigated a family home in Moundsville, West Virginia, where they were having multiple instances of paranormal activity, and they asked us to come in and investigate. But due to a scheduling mistake, when we showed up, there was a whole crowd of people there. Another paranormal team had showed up to investigate, and some of the family's friends were there as well. So we had to come up with an idea, a plan, to get the people out of the house so we could conduct our investigation to back up the family's claims. What we decided to do was have everyone leave this house, including, including us, us, with only our cameras and equipment inside. And what we captured change the way we investigate the paranormal forever. And on this list is our number one best piece of paranormal evidence captured while on abandonment. Since then, we've left cameras and equipment set up in nearly 120 empty haunted buildings and collected nearly 800 hours of footage when no one was inside. So on this video, let's count down the top 10 best pieces of paranormal evidence that we captured during abandonment. Coming in at number 10 is the haunted house on Maine. You see, about three years ago, Steve was actually searching for a brand new building to move his haunted museum, the Archive of the Afterlife. Steve had been in communication with a gentleman who had this property for rent and he was very interested in renting it for the museum, but he wanted to do a preliminary investigation just to see if there was any type of hauntings or anything like that going on within the building. From the look of the pics that they put up, it looked interesting, looked large enough, spacious enough for the uh, collection. So uh, it's kind of, you come to this point where uh, we're gonna try to give it a preliminary investigation to see if, uh, and this is where the, the collection needs to go. We traveled to Cameron, West Virginia. And when we got there to investigate the house, we didn't know much about it. We really didn't know any of the history. But you see, that night was cold. That night was frigidly cold and the windstorm had knocked out the power to every single building in the city. You wanna talk about eerie. You wanna talk about creepy. This entire city was dark and it was quiet. Alrighty. Let's check her out. We knew that the house was old, but we didn't know how old. So we wanted to walk through and see which areas would be the best for us to set up our equipment and try to document something during abandonment. It's getting colder. Yeah. yeah. We don't mean you any harm. Yeah, I got static on me right now. We don't mean you any harm. We don't want to hurt you. We're just here to talk to you and see if you want to talk to us. And as it turns out, the room on the back left side of the house gave us paranormal activity that we would never forget. Because the power was out, we didn't have any electricity to power the IR lights that we plug into the wall. And we only had three that ran off of batteries. So when we put our action camera in that far back left-hand room, we had to use one of our camera lights, the panel lights that we use to light interviews and light our B-roll shots, the same panel lights that are being used to light this interview with me right now. We put fresh batteries on it, turned it on, and we left the house. Immediately after setting up abandonment and leaving the house, the camera in the foyer captured some disembodied voices.
Then just a few minutes later in that far back room, the one where we had the panel light set up, the panel light started to flicker. And then it turned off. And at first we hadn't noticed that the light was off until we saw it flick back on and it caught our attention. Look in here, we're filming an abandonment. You can see we have a light on in here and this light has been turning off and on by itself. It was just off for what, a good 10 minutes? Mm -hmm. Yep. And it is a camera light. It's literally one of our reliable panel camera lights. We've never, we've never ever had a problem with it in the past. Because at first when I noticed it was off, I didn't see you up there by Dave's car. I thought you went in to fix something. Right, no, I've been out here. I was just standing by the car for that YouTube live stream. So, this is really weird. It just went, it off. Just went off again. Yep, see the lights off now. I'm looking forward to seeing the footage. Before, I before promise. it went off this last time, again, it got dim, and then it got bright. When dim, got bright, and Dave said, if, you, if you're in there that can hear us, turn that light off. When you were talking to Steve, and it wasn't 10 seconds, the light went off. <laughs> That's you know, so yeah, creepy. Something is manipulating that light because it's going in, out, in, out. That's not something that normally happens with those lights. They're very reliable. But even still, it's, they're brand new batteries. Yeah, I mean, I charged every single battery. Mm -hmm. And we only have had that light set up for, you know, a little while. It hasn't even been used for half an hour. Mm -mm. There's no, no reason it should be off. Like something was manipulating and playing with that light because we'd never had one of these panel lights act like that before. When the battery dies, the light just turns off. It doesn't flicker. It doesn't turn on and off. So what was happening was very strange. Throughout the live stream, you can see multiple times that the light comes on, goes off, it dims, it fades on and off. And right towards the end of the live stream, it completely goes off and does not come back on. We decided to head back inside the house when abandonment was done and we knew that light was still off inside that room and that camera was capturing nothing but darkness. Been setting out in the car here for the abandonment at the location and we've noticed through the window of the back room we have camera set up and a light panel and the light in about 40 minutes has went off three times. Um, it's brand new battery, there's no reason at all that the light should be going off. It went off three times. And before it went off the third time, the light, you could very clearly see from outside, it went dim, went bright, dim, bright, and it's off again. There was nobody in this house. There was no reason that light should be going off like that. So we're a little bit apprehensive as to what we're gonna walk in on. Yeah, let's go in there and figure out what's going on. Let's go right to that room and see if we can figure it out. If the battery was drained, it would It'd go done. off. Yeah. There's no excuse for that. Yeah, if the battery dies, it just goes off. As we walked through the house, there was a creepy feeling in the air. It was like someone was watching us and we really couldn't explain it. As we rounded the corner from the kitchen to head down that hallway into that room, we had no idea what was about to happen to us. Hello? Whoa, it just came back on. Holy sh Are you kidding me? What the f man? Are you f***ing with me right now? Hello? Just walked in, the freaking light just turned on. Oh my God. Oh, dude, I have chills. Thank you. This is for real. This is a battery. Again, there is no electricity running in there's, this house. There's nothing on it, like nothing is... Shake the light a little bit. See if it's there's loose. a battery pack on it. No Sound way. is a freaking panel, man. Oh my god. <laughs> did you, you just turn it off? I, I did. Yeah, yeah, I did. Okay. Dave just right. turned it off, but... 
That is probably one of the craziest things we've we've had happen. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's really weird. Creepy is one word for it. Yeah, that is that is that is one of the craziest and creepiest things that we've had happen on an episode of Paranormal Quest. Literally, as Boom. soon as we walked in, it turned it turned back yeah. on. Yeah, as I was coming, you guys were already in. As I came through the door, pretty much. Turned on. And this, just for, for the record, this door is locked. We would have seen them. Yeah. yeah. See, this door right here, I was told by the property owner. Look, it's even taped shut. Look. Yeah, it's taped shut up here on top. We did not enter this door. It was absolutely bizarre to see the light come back on as you're standing there looking at it in the pitch black and it just illuminates the room. It catches you completely off guard. And the fact that it just stayed on and didn't go off anymore lends credibility to me that something was in there messing with that light. It had been off for 18 minutes. And then as soon as we step through the threshold, it turns back on. We have no explanation for this. And understandably, we were shocked. The key is going to be with the footage on that camera. Yeah. That's, that's going to tell the tale. That's crazy. Whoa. It just came back on. Holy f Coming in at number nine is the Bell Mansion in Fort Wayne, Indiana. It was built by a man named Robert Bell for he and his wife, Clara. And they lived in that house for years. In public, Robert and Clara were the perfect couple, supportive, loving. But behind these walls, behind these doors, they held secrets of anger, rage, abuse, isolation, that are still trapped in the walls of the Bell Mansion to this day. The Bell Mansion would later become one of the biggest funeral homes in Fort Wayne, providing tens of thousands of funerals during its 93 year operation. And the anguish and the grief that was felt inside this building still replays itself to this day. As we were getting ready to leave for abandonment, we stood in Clara Bell's room describing where we had each of the cameras. And we started to walk back the hallway to leave the Bell Mansion empty. And above our heads, on the third floor, the REM pod went off. Clara, we know that you uh, weren't always allowed to speak your mind the way that you wanted to. Yeah. Robert. Robert, you gotta let Clara speak, okay? We're leaving. leaving. After only being gone from the Bell Mansion for four minutes, the camera in the embalming room picked up the sound of a child's laughter. It literally sounded like a child just down the hallway from the camera, from the embalming room, laughing and giggling as though they were living out just another day. This voice was captured very clearly and it sounded just like a child right down the hallway, giggling and laughing. But shortly after that upstairs on the third floor, the camera's audio picked up a very clear and whispery voice. That sounds like it said, hey.
And after this voice comes through, the EDI meter alerts a temperature and an air pressure change within the room. Could we have just captured proof that this paranormal activity changes the environment in which it occurs? Or is it that the change in the environment causes the paranormal activity? Let us know what you think in the comments below. And for the remainder of the abandonment, the equipment in the embalming room and on the third floor continued to alarm the entire time until we came back. One thing's for sure, this mansion is definitely haunted. Sitting in Atchison, Kansas is a beautiful villa that is number eight on our list of best abandonment evidence. McIntyre Villa is in Atchison, Kansas, and was built in 1889 by John McIntyre. And there are multiple reasons for McIntyre Villa to be haunted, most of which are the nine people that they know of that passed away inside this house. All of them have been natural causes except for one, which was Charles Donovan, Mr. McIntyre's second wife's youngest son. He committed suicide October 10th, 1922. Anna's brother, who was a judge in Atchison, moved in. His name was Charles. He moved in with his wife. He did not die here, but he is the one that found his nephew, Charles, after he committed suicide. Anna was Mr. McIntyre's second wife. Her mother, Anna, passed away in 1898. Then Mr. McIntyre passed away of dropsy uh, in 1902. Mrs. McIntyre passed away in 1916. Um, it, would be, it became a boarding house 1925 to 1952. In that time frame, I've only found one death, and that was a four-day-old infant. Location owner Stephanie O'Reilly has several security cameras throughout the house, and throughout the years, she has documented several paranormal instances. In my opinion, McIntyre Villa is haunted. In 1952, a woman named Isabel Altus bought the home, and Isabel was known by all of her friends as Goldie. She passed away right here, sitting in a chair in front of the fireplace. And that chair is right here behind me. The very chair. This is the chair that Goldie, Isabel, passed away in. And if you think, of something that could hold energy, that moment in life, literally her transition from life to death to spirit happened in this chair. So who knows what is attached to this chair. Now for abandonment, we set up a camera in the parlor and purposefully put a rim pod on her favorite chair. Now we're leaving. Eight minutes after we left, that REM pod alarmed. It was like Goldie was still sitting in her favorite chair, even though the house was completely empty. And 20 minutes later, it would alarm again. So what do you think? Leave us a comment below. Do you think Goldie is still sitting in her favorite chair haunting the McIntyre Villa? McIntyre Villa was one of those places where we felt eyes on us. We felt like we were watched the entire time we were there. Like we weren't alone. And maybe we weren't. Sitting in the quiet town of Greenville, Pennsylvania, is the mansion that made number seven on our list, the haunted Greenville Manor. This gorgeous mansion was built 
by Thomas Gibson for he and his two sons, Frank and Howard. One of the most tragic stories of Greenville Manor centers around Howard. The interesting fact about Howard is that he was a lieutenant in the U.S. Army during World War I, and as many people know, to be a member of the U.S. Army, you go through extensive firearm training courses. But upstairs in the bedroom, while cleaning his service pistol, the gun went off, fatally wounding Howard. His wife heard it, and she went across, and it was already too late, and he had, you know, passed on. Howard is just one of the many spirits that's said to haunt Greenville Manor. And the undertaker services were provided by McMillan Funeral Home. And whether it was coincidence or fate, McMillan Funeral Services purchased this home and moved their business in. For the decades that followed, the house was used to provide funeral services for the city of Greensburg, Pennsylvania. Funeral homes are uniquely haunted because of the grief and the anguish that people feel and possibly the energy of the deceased that lingers behind well after the remains are gone. We know one thing, and that is, this is one of the most bizarre and frightening nights that we have ever had inside of a haunted location. Something just- What? Normally during an investigation, we can get abandonment set up and be out within just a few minutes, but this time was just a little bit different. Rolling. Something is setting off the motion sensor up here. As we're setting up abandonment, I don't believe it's me. Hello? Unless it's being blocked by this. For 45 minutes, we ran from room to room, chasing different pieces of equipment, alarming and occurrences happening around us. We couldn't even get out the door. The motion sensor still going off upstairs, which we can't figure out why. We heard the mel meter detect temperature change, which the camera's not on up there yet, but we heard it. And as soon as we said we heard that, boom, the cat ball went off. We haven't even left for abandonment yet, and this place is just like Dave said, off the charts with paranormal activity. There it goes again. It's going nuts. Hello? It was, it's at a point six right now. When we set that up, it was at a zero. Okay. For this one, the last camera we set up was actually down in the basement, and even that didn't go to plan. I say we hurry up and get, get out of here, because I think we're ready to yeah. see what's up. Let's get this camera to the basement. But what we didn't know was when we set up that camera and started recording, an unexplainable camera malfunction would corrupt the file, causing it to need repairing. And after we got home and repaired that file, this is what remained. This is crazy. We cannot even get the fandom started because there's so much activity. There is a lot going on. I mean, I don't know how to explain it. I felt like I just got touched right before you turned the on, so. I don't know. Somebody's ready to communicate in here. Only after 10 minutes of recording, the camera shut down and the file was so corrupted that it needed to be repaired to try and be saved. We can't explain that sound that you're hearing. It almost sounds like a buzzing or a beeping sound. And we have used this camera for years and have never had it malfunction in this way. And we still use it to this day. And it's never malfunctioned in this fashion since then. That's the rim on the uh, millimeter. Hello? Motion. We went back up to the attic to plug in the camera so it wouldn't die while we were gone. And while we were in there, I was explaining to the spirits how to actually use the paranormal music box. Man, we brought all of these things up here for you to use.
Right over here on the chair, there's a music box. And almost immediately, the paranormal music box alarmed. And if you walk in front of it or try to touch it, it'll go off. That was not the wrong thing. So we immediately left the attic, walked downstairs, and left the house so we could start the abandonment. So immediately, we run for the door. Screaming, we're leaving on the way out to let the cameras know that the house is empty. All right, now we're leaving. But we had no idea just how strange things would get with that music box. As soon as that back door closed, and the house was empty, the paranormal music box started to alarm. And for the entire duration of that abandonment session, it never stopped. Meanwhile, down on the other floors, all of the equipment was going off. And along with that, strange and unusual sounds were heard. <laughs> including a scratching on the walls that sent chills up our spine. The mystery of Greenville Manor is not based off of just one piece of paranormal evidence. But by a night filled with paranormal activity. And it is a night that we will never forget. Number six, Madison Seminary. Madison Seminary opened in 1845 as a school for college and high school age boys. As the years went on and the school expanded, the very first brick structure that is still on site to this day was built in 1859. The boys moved out and in 1890, the Ohio Women's Relief Corps moved in. To be used as a shelter for women who were widowed by the Civil War. As the wars continued, Overcrowding became an issue, and the current largest structure on the property, the Ohio Cottage, was then built. But in 1962, the building was purchased by the Ohio Department of Mental Hygiene and Corrections and was turned into a place called Opportunity Village, where honor inmates were given the privilege to take care of and care for psychiatric patients. Imagine that inmates taking care of psychiatric patients. And this is where the history of the fourth floor becomes very interesting. Actually, they still call it the asylum to this day. It's a long hallway with rooms lining the edges where psychiatric patients lived and were cared for. And this is where we captured something shocking. That ends up at number six on our list. This is going to be pumping out all sorts of energy during abandonment. And hopefully when we get back, I think this is where we should start. Yes. And try and use this energy for them to communicate. We'll be back. Shortly after we left, the building completely empty with cameras running throughout. The camera up on the fourth floor in the asylum captured what sounds like someone moving around.
And then, about 45 minutes later, a strange light appears on the right side of the hallway. It looks like flames dancing across the wall as it suddenly appears out of nowhere before drifting to the left and slowly disappearing. And there's no way that any outside lights could be coming in through a window and reaching this wall. The first thing that we noticed is the wall on which the light appears is not really visible to any windows. So any lights coming through the windows would have a very hard time shining onto this particular wall. And the light did not come from the plasma ball because the camera was set up there for nearly an hour and not once at any other point did that light appear on any other part of the frame. We're not really sure what this anomaly is, but maybe you could let us know what you think it is in the comments below. Because we have no idea. There is one thing we are sure of. The people who lived and died here are still here. Sitting in Dresden, Ohio is a magnificent mansion built by G.W. Adams. His wife Mary and their seven children. Over the years, the Adams family saw a lot of tragedy. Over the years, Mr. Adams himself his daughter and his granddaughter all passed away in the house. But some of the paranormal activity and energy still trapped in these walls came from an entirely different source. It was a stop on the Underground Railroad where slaves would hide to avoid being captured. But through all the history of this building, there are a lot of legends that cannot be verified like the legend of a bounty hunter who came to Prospect Place searching for runaway slaves. The staff of the house allegedly drug him to the barn and took his life. And while that happened out in the barn, the paranormal occurrence that we're talking about actually happened down in the basement. Even though there was no one on property and we had left to go get dinner, the camera in the basement at the end of the hallway captured the sound of the entry door opening. Now that door is held open for over a minute. And you can hear it slowly creaking as it's being held open. Before finally coming back to a complete close. We have no idea what actually caused this because the door is held closed with very strong metal springs. And we would have loved to capture that visually on video. But we know for sure that that door opened and closed and we have no idea what did it. They have been abandoned and placed at the mercy of the state. In the case of Penhurst, the state has failed to do its moral duty. Penhurst, state, school, and hospital. It's become synonymous with haunted. In Spring City, Pennsylvania, this institution was built 
to teach and house people with developmental disabilities. And it was built with the best intentions in mind. But as the place became overcrowded and the hospital became understaffed, neglect and tragedy were commonplace in these halls. But the biggest problem here at Pennhurst and at most of these places around here was the overcrowding. I mean, people just shoved people in here. When Pennhurst first opened in 1908, it was meant for 500 people, but by 1911, it was already up to 1,500 people. 1,500. Obviously, they opened up more buildings, but it wasn't enough. And actually, in the 50s, it capped out at about 5,500 patients they had here at one time. It was so bad, they had patients sleeping on the floor. I think Pennhurst is in the condition it's in because nobody cares. Human beings laying unclothed in their own filth for weeks, living a real life nightmare inside these buildings. But many people believe the patients, the people who lived these atrocities are still inside these walls, waiting to speak. Our night at Pennhurst started in a building called Devon. We spent about an hour in Devon, moving from the basement up to the first floor, up to the second floor, before finally deciding to take a break and leaving this building empty with two cameras set up for a short abandonment session. While we were in the Mayflower building all the way across campus, it sounds like someone's moving in there. But the camera on the second floor captured one of our most eyebrow-raising, head-scratching pieces of paranormal evidence to date. On the far left side of frame, a solid object or shadow moves from the bottom to the top. Just outside of that edge of the frame is a doorway that leads into a separate room. And could it be possible that one of the former patients, residents, or even staff of Pennhurst State School and Hospital moved out of this room and passed the camera. Whatever it was, it was certainly creepy. Sitting in Sumner, Illinois, is a building known as Pine Lawn Manor. The building had been constructed originally to be apartments, but in 1970, they opened a nursing home inside these walls. And for over 30 years, it took care of the elderly and others nearing the end of their lives. And it's estimated that hundreds of people have passed away here at Pine Lawn Manor. When we arrived on location, we were given a tour by a paranormal investigator named Lennon O'Hare. He's the lead investigator of a group called Midwest Supernatural. He had investigated there several times and had many stories to tell us. One of which occurred inside a room known as the doll room. And she was communicating with that doll and she was communicating that doll was very angry. And I was kind of standing in this doorway, just kind of leaning on it, facing them. I wasn't really in the in it. I was just listening. And uh, as they were doing that, I started getting a really, really bad burning sensation on my back. I lift my shirt up, had Tony look at it. I had about a two inch, pretty sizable, welted scratch on my back. Nah, uh, Lennon? Yeah. I, yeah. Somebody scratched you, bro. Yeah, I want you to get a good glimpse of this, my friend. I'm video cameraing it for you. Gosh damn, dude, that's deep. I, I, wow. And yeah, I was standing just like you are right now, and there's no chance I'd hit my back on something or sure. scratch myself that hard. You know, it was very, looked very deep almost.
For abandonment, this was one of the rooms where we had a camera set up. We wanted to see if anything unexplainable would happen with that doll in particular. And 40 minutes after we left, the camera captured something that we still cannot explain. It actually looks like there's a shadow that moves from the end of the bed toward the doll. And we have no explanation for this. And we spent a lot of time trying to figure this out. We know that it wasn't a bat because a bat would have flown in circles around the room. And it definitely was not any other animal because the only entrance to the room is clearly in frame. Our other thought was, well, the camera's in front of a window. Maybe there's a light outside shining in. But this shadow is not coming from an exterior light source. This shadow passes through the light from our infrared night vision cameras, moving up the bed and reflecting that light back into the camera. Whatever moved from the end of the bed toward the doll was actually inside the room. This will go down in history as one of the creepiest shadows we've ever captured. And we still have no explanation for this. Out of all of the buildings that I could think of that would be haunted, hospitals would be at the top of that list. In Harriman, Tennessee, sits a hospital built in the 1930s and used for the medical care of the community for decades. This hospital is massive at nearly 200,000 square feet. And in every single part of this hospital, someone has passed away. The tour guides and paranormal investigators have had countless experiences that they just can't explain, including seeing a child in an area of the hospital known as the geriatric ward. One of our guests, Chris Devin and I were here at the time where, where Chris is standing and there was a picture of a little child. You could see knickers. That's all you can see is the legs down. This child's got knickers on. Standing right there in the doorway is a little girl with hospital gown on. And it's in this part of the hospital that we captured some of the best paranormal evidence that we have ever captured. In the hallway called the geriatric mental health ward, this camera captured something chilling. This music sounds very close to the camera and lasts nearly eight minutes. And probably the most shocking part of this evidence is we were in the hospital in the other building and had no idea this was happening. And the weirdest part of it all is the music keeps starting and stopping almost like it's glitching. Thank you. 
And in the middle of this music, a very creepy, clear, and audible child's voice says, Meow. As soon as we got home and realized what we'd captured, we contacted the tour guides of the Harriman Hospital to figure out what the hell our cameras recorded. Rhonda, our tour guide, went to every single floor of the old building searching for toys that played music, pushing their buttons and trying to match them. And we think we found out which toy it was. Sitting just around the corner from the camera is this learning table. Seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Then there's nine. Counting really great with numbers. When you learn numbers, then you can count. And count again. And it sounds like someone or something was pressing the buttons on the toy to make it play. Now, still to this day, we have not been able to match exactly the music and sounds that we captured on camera. But we are so excited to go back in the near future and figure out truly where that music was coming from. At the beginning of this video, Ryan and I both told you of the story that began the abandonment sessions. Oh my god. Oh my god. For our number one best piece of paranormal evidence ever captured during an abandonment session, we go back to where it all began. You see, there was this house in Moundsville, West Virginia, where a family was experiencing bizarre and unexplainable things. Shadows, voices, objects being thrown. And in July of 2012, we were contacted by Chris Dedman to investigate this home. And even the parents were terrified as they frequently witnessed their children talking to no one. And I remember when we showed up, a crowd of people enveloped the interior of this house. And with this noisy crowd, there was no way we were going to be able to capture any paranormal evidence. So as the night went on and the noise and contamination enveloped everything that we were doing, we came up with a master plan. Set up the cameras and the audio recorders and the equipment and have everyone leave the house, including us. And as we were going through the house setting up equipment, Ryan kept saying, We're leaving, and if you have anything to tell us, now is the time. Repeating it in every part of the house. And once everything was set and ready, we took all of the people. We all went out the back door and the house was officially empty. But what we captured left us with our jaws on the floor. It actually sounds like a little girl saying, tell them what? And then you hear a woman say, we don't do that. We captured the clearest voices, disembodied voices that we have ever heard in our lives. 
That happened 11 years ago. And still to this day, listening to that recording makes the hair all over our body stand on end. And could this mother and daughter duo still be communicating from another dimension? Let us know what you think in the comments below. So there you have it. The top 10 pieces of paranormal evidence that we've captured on abandonment sessions. Yes. So. And with that, that is the end of the episode. We thank you so much for watching this one. Let us know in the comments below what you thought about each of these moments and leave a timestamp of what your favorite moment was. It's going nuts. Make sure you like, subscribe to the channel, comment, and share with anyone who would find this countdown interesting. We'll see you next time. Relieving. Bye.